has turned me Get lost in my mistakes it Looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your strength But my story isn't over My story's just begun Failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does He said failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Stephen. Welcome to Cokesbury Church. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to encourage you to jump in our chat. It's right there in front of you. We would love to connect with you. It's a great way to meet some folks and to find out more about our church. We've been in this series that we're calling Focused. And what we're doing as we approach and now are into the summer, we're trying to figure out how do we become more focused as individuals and more focused as a church to make sure that we're fulfilling the purpose that God has for our life. And so we started out a couple of weeks ago by talking about um, one of the commitments that we all need to make is to attend a weekend to get filled up. And the idea is that when we gather together, whether it's online or in person, that this is our moment every single week to kind of get our souls filled back up so we can face a brand new week. And then last week, Anna talked about how we need to encourage each other to invite a friend for the purpose of sharing hope. We all know somebody in our life 
who is desperate for hope. And it's our job as followers of Jesus to kind of lean into those relationships and understand that our faith, while it is a personal decision to follow Jesus, it's supposed to be lived out loud. And so there are people in your circle of influence and in my circle of influence who are in desperate need of hope. And so we want to invite them to join us as we attend a weekend to get filled back up. And today we're gonna talk about the third commitment that I'm asking everyone to make, and that is to take a next step so that you can grow. If you have a copy of the scriptures with you, we're gonna be in 1 Timothy chapter four. We're gonna look at a few power pack verses that I think give us some insight into this idea of taking a next step. So here we go. 1 Timothy four, verse seven. Paul says, do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. I've been thinking about this. We've got an amazing capacity to get distracted, right? Like all you've gotta do is spend about 10 minutes on social media. There are so many voices that are vying for space in my mind and your mind that it really can at times seem overwhelming. But here's what I know. We only get one shot in life. Like, this is not a dress rehearsal. And the clock of your life and the clock of my life, it's always ticking. In fact, the older we get, the faster it seems that the hands on the clock spin. And so why would any of us wanna waste a single second that we've been given? I mean, think about it. It seems like we get mad or we get offended or we become frustrated or something triggers us so easily these days. And I just wanna say that that's not the way our lives have to go. Like you can make a choice right now that I'm not gonna be dr driven insane by whatever outrage rules the day, nor am I gonna allow myself to drift. See, I would argue that drift is one of the great enemies of the human soul. It's not like an outright rejection of God. It's not like shaking your fist at heaven at God. It's just sort of slipping into this mindset where we just end up going through the motions. So Paul makes a warning right off the bat. Be very careful about these things. Verse eight, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is why we work hard to continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God, who is the savior of all people and particularly of all believers. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because, because you're young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Now, I would argue that this right here is massive. Paul says, be an example. Like, let your light shine, right? The way that we love others, not just the people that we like, but those we disagree with, those people that we would consider our enemies, the way we practice our faith, the way we choose to live our lives, Paul says it should be an example. Now, let's be honest. We shouldn't have to tell people we're a Christian, right? It ought to be obvious that something is different just by how we interact with the world around us. Paul's saying, be an example. And if that's the case, let me ask you a question. How you doing on the whole example deal? Like, really? <laughs> Verse 14, Paul says, do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. I like that right there. Paul's saying, throw yourself in so that everyone can see your progress. See, following Jesus, it's not about perfection. It's about progress. It's not about, can I get every single thing right? It's about, can I keep moving forward? It's about, can I get better? Can I become more loving? Can I be a more generous person? Can I be quicker at offering forgiveness more frequently? Can I serve more regularly? Can I learn to actually think before I speak? Can I get to a place where I can temper my anger? Can I take my next step toward becoming a closer version of who God intends me to be? It's about the process, y'all. It's about recognizing, you know what? We're on a journey. Our lives are really going somewhere. I may not be 
who I need to be, but I'm sure not who I used to be, and I didn't do a thing about it. It's because I followed in the footsteps of Jesus. Verse 16, keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. Now, notice the language that Paul uses here. Words like, don't waste time. He introduces this idea of training your soul just like you train your body, of, of working hard, of throwing yourself into, of keeping a close watch. All of this points to re one really important idea or concept, that when it comes to getting ourselves spiritually fit, one of the key ingredients is this concept of growth. It's about taking your next step. Paul is encouraging and I think emphatically pleading with Timothy, don't get too comfortable. In essence, what he's saying in those verses is, look, don't coast, don't relax, don't allow yourself to drift. Just grow. When something grows, it's the process of growing in size, right? When something grows, it sprouts. There's development, there is maturity involved. And I honestly believe that if we're gonna do what God is asking us to do, it's going to require all of us to take seriously this business of growth. And so what I wanna do today is just introduce four areas where I'd like to challenge all of us, myself included, to grow over these summer months. And the first one is probably the most obvious. I wanna challenge you to grow your faith. Now, what does that mean? Well, first I think it means there has to be a willingness to learn, right? Like, find a way to immerse yourself in Scripture on a regular and consistent basis. Paul gives us insight into why this is important. This is from the Amplified Version in the second book he wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, every Scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration, and profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline and obedience, and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will and thought, purpose, and action. In other words, God was very intentional about providing us with a roadmap, right? A directive that will help make our path straight as we walk through life. See, growth and maturity, they don't happen by osmosis. We don't just sort of stumble into becoming the people that God wants us to be. See, we believe that the scriptures will help us unlock real life and lead us down a path toward peace, a path toward hope and joy, a path that provides a lasting sense of satisfaction, see? And think about it, the Bible has never been more accessible I did a little research this week. The Guinness Book of World Records gives the record to the most number of translations to just one guy, it's L. Ron Hubbard, the guy that wrote about Scientology. It's been translated into like 65 languages. Most sacred scripture hasn't been translated very much. The Quran, for example, is supposed to be read in Arabic. So most Muslim scholars don't consider it authentic or official if you read it in any other language. The Book of Mormon has only been translated into about 100 different languages. How many languages do you think the Bible's been translated into? It's interesting. According to the Wycliffe Organization, the Bible can be found in 2,656 different languages. And I'll tell you something. Some of the greatest heroes that have ever lived have names that you and I will never hear and faces that we will never see. They've gone to foreign continents to get to know cultures and tribes and have spent decades devoting their whole life to studying languages so that they could give people the scriptures. There's never been a book like this. Um, every single year, 65 million copies are bought in the United States. The average home has three copies. It's fascinating. A lot of people, especially here in the South, we hold this book with great reverence. We buy it, we give it, we own it, we cherish it, we'll make references to it. The problem is we don't actually read it. According to George Gallup, two-thirds of people surveyed could not tell you who delivered the Sermon on the Mount. Fewer than half could not name the first book of the Bible, which, by the way, is Genesis. There have been huge fights over hanging the Ten Commandments in schools or outside courtrooms, 
80% of Americans claim to believe in the Ten Commandments, yet the vast majority could not even name four. 80% of born-again Christians, not the general public, believe that the phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is actually in the Bible. A staggering 12% of people surveyed thought Noah's wife was Joan of Arc. 30% believe that the epistles were the wives of the apostles. Now, actually, I just made that one up right there. But the rest really is true. So if you want to grow, if you want to live the life of someone who can overcome, if you want to follow Jesus and live your life as a reflection of his life, you got to pick up the book and you got to read it. And listen, there are tons of ways you can do this. You can go to YouVersion at Bible.com. You'll find hundreds of translations. There are Bible study plans that you don't have to kind of fumble your way through. They've got it lined out where every single day you can spend 5, 10, 20 minutes in Scripture. You can highlight and make notes. You can um, get it right there on your phone or your tablet. I mean, it's waiting on you every single morning. For those of you that are connected to our church, we have a daily reading plan because we believe that God's word is important and that, it, that as it washes over our soul, it enlightens how we view the world around us. So you gotta, you gotta ramp up your study, but you also gotta ramp up your prayer life. We believe that prayer is an incredibly powerful force and sometimes we get messed up on this. One time, Paul wrote, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And so we do that. We actually find discipline to stop and pray. Maybe we do it while we're driving. Maybe it's when we get a few quiet moments at home. Maybe it's in the middle of the night when everybody else is asleep. Maybe we do it night after night after night. Maybe nothing happens. And it feels like our prayers are, for some reason, bouncing off the ceiling. And even though we'd never admit it, in a context like this, secretly what happens is many of us give up. We don't pray because we really aren't convinced that it works. And the reason we don't think it works is because it doesn't work the way we think it should. Paul gives this great advice to pray always. And here's the result. He says, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your heart and your minds in Christ. See, it's not about getting a wish fulfilled. It's not about just making our requests of how we want our life to go, hoping that God will grant those wishes. It's this, it's this conversation that we're having with the person that loves us the most, right? It's, it's finding a, a sense of balance or a sense of, peace in the midst of the storm. It, it's not so much about getting the yes or the no or the maybe or this is what I really want for you. What it's about is staying connected with God. And Paul says that when you do that, you get the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And it's that peace that will guard your heart and your mind. So you got to ramp up your prayer life. Here's another one. You got to find a place to serve if you want to grow your faith. You just have to. You got to find a way to consistently and routinely give yourself away. There's something about stepping outside of ourselves and focusing our attention on someone else that has a way of bringing perspective back to life. And so that's what you gotta do if you wanna grow your faith. Here's another area that I wanna challenge us, is to grow your family. Just make a commitment that for the rest of this year, you're gonna do something that causes you to experience growth in your relational lives. And listen, this is huge because relationships are the fabric of human existence. I mean, think about it. Being connected to another human being, learning to actually live beyond the casual superficialities of life, actually living at a level where we know someone and we are fully known, where we're connected and loved and accepted, where we feel safe, that's a really big deal. This is especially true inside families. You see, families are supposed to be training grounds. They're like the practice field. They're where the next generation gets molded and shaped and prepared to be the very best version of themselves possible. In essence, families are people factories. And you guys know if you're a parent, it is so easy to get distracted. 
It's so easy to get preoccupied or to get off base or to just get overwhelmed with life. And before you know it, like huge chunks of time can go by and we don't even realize what happened. And so for the rest of this year, just go ahead and make the commitment with you. And if you're married with your spouse, make it as a whole family that we're gonna be intentional. We're not gonna drift. We're gonna stay connected. Because in the end, all we have left are the relationships that we experience in our life. So grow your family. Here's another one. Grow your finances, right? Money represents a battleground for a lot of us. And listen, I know it's uncomfortable to talk about, especially in church. But we gotta see it for what it is. Money is a tool that we can leverage for our advantage. Like everything that comes into our life, all the finances, all the relationships, all of what we would consider to be blessings, everything good in your life and my life was given to us by God himself. And God expects you and I to be stewards that he's given us, to not go through life with closed fists, but to approach life with open hands. There is so much power in learning to get control over our financial life. It'll break the back of greed. It'll set us up to see that there's a whole world around us that's waiting to be impacted. It gives us a tangible way to make a difference in somebody's life. It's not about what God wants from you. It's about what God wants for you. God understands that when you live your life with an open hand, that you're much more able to receive what God has to give you. But there's one more area especially at the end of the year that we've just experienced, that I think we all need to be challenged to grow, is that sometimes you gotta have a little fun. I mean, this is massive. You and I were created for joy. It's God's desire that you and I actually enjoy life. That little prefix, E-N, it means to make or create or cause to be in the place, condition, or state named in the stem. Therefore, what it says is, sometimes we've got to make, we've got to create, we've got to cause joy to be present in our lives. You guys know this. Happiness is so fleeting, and it's totally dependent upon your circumstance. If things are going the way that I want them to go, then I feel good. I'm happy. If things don't go my way, then my sense of happiness starts to drop. But joy, on the other hand, it occurs in spite of my current circumstance. Joy is something that gets developed as we grow and we mature into the people that God made us to be. Listen, it's not that hard. Just commit to these four things, to growing your faith, to growing your family, to growing your finances, and to having a little fun along the way. And I promise you, if you'll make those your next steps, you're gonna live your life focused with clarity and purpose and it'll be powerful. It'll impact everybody around you. You know, we talk about this often because I think it's one of the great enemies of our day. The scriptures teach us, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. And then there's this question, what is your life? It's a question that every single human being has to answer. It goes on, you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Time is a very funny thing. When you're young, it seems like one day can last a month. But the older we get, the faster the clock ticks. And the truth is that our entire life is gonna be dictated by two dates, neither of which you and I have much control or influence over. There is the date that we were born, we didn't get to choose that. And there's the date that we will leave this life and we will move on to the next. And the sum total of our existence It's gonna be represented in that little dash. And it's in that dash that you and I have gotta do all of our living. As I've thought about that, I think the three saddest words in the English language are simple. They're I don't know. For those of us who are parents, these are typically the words we hear from our kids, right? When they've done something that we didn't want them to do. In our case, it was why did you hit your brother? I don't know. Why did you draw on the wall? I don't know. Why did you try to ride the dog? You're way too big. I don't know. What were you actually thinking? I don't know. My fear is that for far too many of us, if we aren't careful, this will be our response when our life comes to an end. Why didn't you love deeply? 
I don't know. Why didn't you show more compassion? I don't know. Why didn't you make a real difference? I don't know. Why didn't you grow? Why didn't you move? Why didn't you reach out? Why didn't you serve people? I don't know. Why didn't you offer forgiveness when you had the shot? Why didn't you ask someone for forgiveness when you had the opportunity? I don't know. Why didn't you pray really great prayers? I don't know. See, on some level, we all know this. Life is unbelievably short and it is unimaginably precious. And so if we're gonna do anything that's profound or anything significant or anything important, if we're gonna do anything that outlasts ourselves, it's gotta be this day. It's about maximizing that dash because it's in that dash. That's where all of the loving and all of the hoping, all of the dreaming, really great dreams, all of the praying, every single bit of the difference making has to happen. Because the hard truth is, you and I cannot do anything about yesterday because it's gone. And we cannot do much to influence tomorrow because it's not here yet. But this day, this is the moment that we have to live our lives. And some of us have got to wake up and we have got to start living. It's way too late to just drift your way through life. God's got too many opportunities, too many blessings, too much grace, too many opportunities out there waiting on us for us to not maximize our dash. That's what Paul's been trying to say to Timothy. Don't waste a second. Use the time you've been given. Stay focused. Live out your purpose. Trust that God is gonna be with you along the way and then sit back and watch everything that God's gonna do in and through your life. It's gonna be the ride of a lifetime. But Paul says, Timothy, you can't get distracted and you've gotta be intentional and you've gotta grow. You gotta keep taking your next steps. And so let me ask you a question. Wherever you're sitting, whether you're with a group or by yourself, what's your next step gonna be? Because the truth of the matter is, the next step that each of us has to take is gonna be different from everybody else because we're all at different levels of our faith. We're all at different points in our walk with Jesus. But what I know for sure is, if you are drawing air into your lungs, you've got a next step to take. And I promise you, if you'll trust God, if you'll step out in faith and take that next step, it'll be the ride of a lifetime. So thanks for joining me today. We're gonna come back, wrap this thing up next weekend. We're gonna be talking about how if we pull our resources together and if we'll live generous lives, we'll live our life on purpose. Take that next step this week and I'll see you next time. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.